Um, really excited to hear from Lisa uh, now. Uh, people tell me she is the font of all knowledge uh, when it comes to sport insights. Um, she is the go-to person, uh, and indeed we've seen the director at Sport England grow uh, immeasurably, really. Um, as a result of her leadership um, and the importance of this agenda to help us all get it uh, right on the ground. Um, Lisa's going to be highlighting some of the key points emerging from Sport England um, and also taking a look at how you, the sector, uh, have responded uh, to Sport England's kind of steer around need for insight and also the support they've provided us uh, in terms of some of the tools that we can all use. So, towards an active nation, an update, and uh, over to you, Lisa. Thank you. I'm feeling somewhat under pressure now. Uh, talk of front of all knowledge and entertaining you and all in 15 minutes, talking about strategy and evaluation. So brace yourselves. Um, OK, I'm going to try and build on some of the things that, that Paul's spoken about today. Um, I will qu quickly talk about Sport England's strategic priorities. Um, and I'm going to talk about the relationship between those <laughs> outcomes that, that Paul mentioned, um, but also the numerical targets and how we kind of deal with that and the, and the inevitable tension there. Um, I'm going to pick up on a small number of lessons we've learnt along the way, and then just look, look at some of the big ticket items for Sport England over the next uh, few months. OK, uh, so uh, you will all, I'm sure, be familiar with the Sport England vision uh, uh, sitting at the heart there. Uh, this summarises the 12 strategic priorities for Sport England that we believe are going to be central to delivering that vision. Now, I put that up there, one, so you can all take a photograph. Uh, and secondly, just to say, this morning, I'm going to focus on those blue hex, uh, hexagons. Uh, but I wanted you to see that they sit within a, a wider context. So uh, the slide is going. It's your last chance to take that picture. OK, right. Measuring success. Um, Paul's already spoken about the five uh, social outcomes within the government strategy, uh, but here's a wee bit of added perspective from me. Um, so the five social outcomes are on the left-hand side of this diagram. Um, and I do genuinely believe that the government strategy is a game changer from the perspective of these uh, outcomes. Um, it's created a massive opportunity for all of us to position sport, exercise and physical activity, and indeed those who deliver it, as of central importance to happy, healthy, productive, and integrated communities. That's what these unlock in terms of us being able to prove our, our impact. Uh, but to prove that, it has to be a compelling case. It really does. Um, and uh, certainly in terms of the numerous policy areas that these talk to, it's worth trying, and it's worth trying really hard. To help us, the government strategy is very clear about specific definitions for these outcomes and how they're going to be measured. And I'm just going to take a minute on these because genuinely, I think everybody's missed this. Because people ask me all the time, well, how, how do we measure the outcomes? So, um, the two physical well-being outcomes there, uh, you'll be very familiar with them. They're the chief medical officer guidelines, it's the 150 minutes and the 30 minutes. They're measured through active lives, and there are also questions that we use to measure at project level. You may be less aware that for mental well-being, there are four questions that have been developed by the Office for National Statistics. Uh, so they look at life satisfaction, happiness, anxiety, and how worthwhile people feel about things. So they sit there, the questions are there, we're asking them in active lives, they are there for you to apply in your own individual projects. When we get to the, the final outcomes, individual development, social and community development, and economic development, again, there are very specific measures. Again, we measure the, the first two in active lives, and the economic development sits within the sports satellite accounts um, that, that come from DCMS. So the measures are there, the questions are there. Now, I know some of you will be sitting here thinking, well, they're all a wee bit generic. And actually, for me, where I work, the context of where I work, the projects that I'm involved in, the partners I work in, 
we've got something a bit more specific when it comes to individual development, a particular aspect of that. That's absolutely fine too. So we, we have to measure both of those. And indeed, for a number of the partners we work with, that's exactly what they do. And a lot of those questions we are collecting. So if you're particularly interested in some of the other ways of looking at individual development, there are questions that are being developed. We're sharing those to help. But the message I think I want to kind of press here is please don't ignore the way in which these have been defined by government because government has made it very clear that this is how resource is going to be allocated. All right? Now, uh, I also know uh, that for many of you, uh, evaluation methodology isn't your bag, right? I know it's not everybody's exciting cup of tea. Uh, so for those of you for whom it's not uh, your area of expertise, help is at hand, right? So here's, here's the first thing to absolutely take away today. And it's that uh, email address at the bottom, evaluationframework.sportingland.org, or just Google Evaluation Framework Sport England because we've developed this framework, which I hope you will tell me is a really intuitive way at looking at how you would develop your evaluation. If you go into it, it will take you through it step by step. There are all manner of resources there. The question bank is there. More information on the outcomes. It's all there to help and guide you. I am a big believer that the best way of getting through this is to make it simple and to make it easy. We do not have to overcomplicate this. All right, so I really want to be able to help, and that would be a really good place for those of you who are, who are thinking about how do we best do this. Please go there and take a look. And please tell me what you think. I'm genuinely trying to create something that helps, so I really, really would appreciate your feedback on that one. Right, so that's the first piece. Um, our challenge, um, and again, we've already spoken about this today, is, is to try and deliver the outcomes in a way that doesn't simply deliver a life-changing experience to a handful of people, or indeed achieve the new numerical targets, but don't improve people's lives in the process. So we've got to get that delicate balance. And in developing our numerical targets with the department, uh, we looked at the national picture of activity. Again, you'll be very familiar with this. It's, it's the Active Life Survey. Um, more importantly, when we get below the headlines, uh, we look at where a lot of those inequalities exist. And so as Paul's already mentioned, the real focus for us has been looking at lower socioeconomic groups and looking at women. And I just want to explain a little bit more about that. So back to the diagram. Uh, so we've got the outcomes on the left. Uh, we've got the numerical targets on the right. Um, an ambition to grow the overall number of people achieving the 150 minutes of moderate intensity sport or physical activity by 500,000. <laughs> I actually view that as achieving 28 million. Because that's the real job, isn't it? We've got to do a job of helping those who are currently active stay active. Right, so that is, it's the 28 million challenge for me. I don't underestimate what's required to help people stay active longer. All right, I don't underestimate that at all. Um, we also have a commitment that at least half of that growth will come through more women being active, building upon the momentum, particularly since the launch of This Girl Can. Uh, Paul's already mentioned it. The campaign goes again later this month. So big message for anyone that's interested in being part of This Girl Can, please sign up to be a partner of the campaign. Go onto this Girl Can website, get your details in there, get access to the resources. Uh, we start filming uh, this week, so I, can, I, I can't tell you a huge amount about it, but I can tell you we are really pushing the boundaries again. We've really gone to what's been a really difficult place for us, asked some difficult questions, and I promise you we're going to create something which is very different and I hope impactful. Um, I've already heard mention today of hard to reach groups. I don't buy into hard to reach groups. I buy into the fact there's a whole load of people out there who we don't traditionally contact, who we don't reach out to, who we don't resonate with. They're not hard to reach, we just have to do it a different way. We've asked ourselves some big questions with this girl, Can, and I hope you see that in the new iteration of the, the uh, film. Um, also, in terms of increasing the number of people from lower socioeconomic groups, um, 100,000, that's not a national target. That is very specific to a number of locations where we are investing targeting audiences that sit within those groups. And the reason why we've done that 
is because we're going against the grain, really. We're going against long-term trends, and we want to learn how to do this. We want to work with partners who really can engage with audiences in this group and help us achieve sustained change. So we've created a target that allows us all the opportunity to test and learn. Um, I guess the key message then, in terms of how we balance between the outcomes and the targets is, we are allocating resource on the basis of both of these. There are trade-offs, but they're not mutually exclusive. And if you're sitting there thinking, hold on, how do I deliver against all these outcomes? Not everybody has to deliver against all the outcomes. It's the outcomes that are most specific to the particular audiences that you're working with. Right, uh, some of you who are, uh, who've been around a little bit longer, and, and I know a little bit more about the, the targets that, that Sport England's had in the past. You might have been looking at those numbers there and thinking, oh, they're a wee bit smaller than, than what we've historically had. Uh, that's because of one of the many lessons we've learned along the way. Um, and I use this to d describe an effect, it's a kind of funnel effect that we see when we look at uh, large-scale behavioural change campaigns. So looking at our own work and looking at projects that we've engaged in, looking at the work of um, other industries, other sectors, we see that time and time again there is this considerable degree of attrition between the desire to change, attempting to change, and sustain change. So if you look at the example on the left-hand side, uh, this is uh, quitting smoking, uh, we know that for every five people that want to quit, Three will attempt to quit, but fewer than one in 15 will succeed in the long term. Now, this isn't an excuse to therefore have lots of small targets, but this is a reality that we need to understand. The challenge for us is about understanding what this funnel effect looks like when it comes to sport and physical activity, because there's very little research out there. And then when we look at particular audiences, that funnel will change in size and shape. We're now measuring in our evaluations to understand this funnel effect for different investments. We're trying to understand what creates the funnel effect, what creates the dropout of people at the various stages. That's the kind of information we need to understand. And actually being really realistic about the number of people we've got to engage at the top in order to create that sustained long-term change at the bottom for a meaningful number of people in order to derive the outcomes that we're seeking, that's really important we understand that too. So that's the business that we're in uh, moving forward. Right, while I'm in the mood to, uh, to share some lessons, uh, I'll keep going. Um, three lessons. Uh, let's pick out this first one. So, universal offers are not universal. Cartoon, yes. Funny, no. And yet, right, you're going to look and go, oh, well, that's common sense. If you don't design an experience that's absolutely meeting the needs of your target audience, chances of success are limited. This idea of one size fits all. Um, in sport, I see a lot of one size fits all. And actually what makes it worse is the size that we pick is the one that is the people who are most active, the people who are most sporty. Because we design a lot of sport and physical activity for those people. So if we really want to engage people who find it really hard to get sport and physical activity, we can't do the one size fits all. Um, so that's why I bang on about really understanding audiences, really delivering something that, that meets their needs. Um, I've been involved actually in the, the last couple of years in a whole lot of swimming pilots, working with a whole lot of different partners in over 100 swimming pools across the country. Lots of different ideas we've been testing. We've identified specific audiences, we've conducted real specific research to understand why they do or don't swim, how they feel about it, how they currently engage. We've designed completely new products. We've completely trained pool staff. We've, re we've um, gone into communities to talk about what's on offer. We thought really imaginatively about what motivates people and what incentives they require. And we've designed some products that are really fundamentally different. And the reality is that by doing that, we've absolutely created growth in a market where in the last few years, it's been in steady decline. So it can be done. Right? We've got more and more examples, um, but it does take us to 
we, we have to be prepared to do things differently. We have to be brave. We have to be brave. Right, a second one, very quickly, is that to succeed, we need to understand that the, the often complex and layered influences that shape our relationship with activity, many of them are actually outside the control of the individual and maybe outside the control of your project, your organisation, um, but they are really, really important because they could be playing the biggest role in terms of whether or not somebody feels able or capable or wants to be active. So when we're talking about inactive people, our tendency in the industry is to talk about why they struggle to be active. We talk about their motivations, their barriers, what they might need to change. But not thinking about that context means that, that we're not doing the big thing, which I think is spend less time looking at what's wrong with them and think about the systems and influences around them. So think about the audiences you work with. Think about the locations where you work. Think about the geography, think about the context. Sit today at some point when you've got a quiet moment and start to draw this. Because these are the organisations that you should be working with. If you want the best chance of changing the outcomes for an individual, you need to understand this interplay. You need to be working with partners who are working in these other spheres. Really, really important. That's the absolute basis of our local delivery pilots, which Paul mentioned. And that's why you'll start to see some very different investments coming through from that work. OK, a couple more from me. Um, it's hard to find opportunities to be active, right? So uh, I, when I was thinking about lessons, I thought this is just a really obvious one. But as long as it's easier for me to book a holiday to Aruba which for those of you who don't know is a small Caribbean island off the coast of Venezuela, than it is to find a table tennis or badminton session in Arundel, we've got a problem. And that is the reality today. I got my mum to do it last night. It was really, really painful. That's why we're working with the Open Data Institute to open up data that identifies opportunities for people to take part in sport and physical activity. That's why we're running competitions to encourage techie experts to use that data to create apps, to do whizzy things that make people out there, makes it easier for them to find us. Now, again, really scary area. For a lot of people, really not your bag. I totally get that. I totally get that. But if you're sitting there thinking, oh, that's okay, well, I'll wait till those people who do really get it, nail it, and then we'll come in. You can't do that, because we're already behind the curve. Every day, other industries are using technology to raise the bar. Expectations raise all the time. I spoke to somebody the other day who told me she uses her phone to get her Uber. If she can't get an Uber in less than five minutes, she's looking for another cab. Five minutes. She has no tolerance beyond that now. And when I think about the hassles people have when they're trying to find opportunities to play sport. So here's what you need to do. Um, Open Data Institute are here today, so please talk to them. But if you do only one thing, do only one thing, get on Google later today and Google Open Active Sport England. Open Active Sport England. There is a three minute film in there. It is worth three minutes of your time to watch that film, understand what we're doing, and get on that bus. Okay? Right. One minute left. So, looking ahead. <laughs> this just gives you a sense of some of the big areas at Sport England that we're focusing on. Um, I'll, pick on I'll pick on a couple of them. So, um, I've spoken about uh, this girl can, national campaigns. We're going to do more than this, just than this, uh, just this girl can. Uh, that is something that's really central to our work, something we're going to do a lot of moving forward. Um, the active environments. We are working with a number of government departments to look at how we can design activity into people's lives, how we can really capitalise on the investment into cycling and walking. So we really are trying to pull other departments together to work together. Um, we're working hard to look at the experience of traditional sport within our core market because we really want to understand how we better keep people in sport. 
But the message I guess I want to give you here is, yes, we invest a lot, but we're also trying to create an environment where it is easier for all of us to engage our customers, reach out to them, and really try to influence their behaviour. So, quick reminder then, check out the outcomes, right? Look at the evaluation framework, make sure you understand those. Google evaluation framework, have a look at it, see if it'll help you, tell me what else you need. Sign up to be a partner of This Girl Can. I promise you there are some fantastic resources coming. They will really, really help you in your day job. Go to the Open Active website, have a look at the film, really engage with that, find out what you do. And finally, if you're sitting here thinking, right, I get all of this, and we can absolutely deliver on this, Sport England need to know about what we're up to, get onto our website, go onto the funding page, and there's a section in there, got an idea. Get on that page, tell us what it is, get in touch, and we'll speak to you. Thank you very much.